What does Hilton Magic mean to you? Well, when I think of Hilton Magic, I think of Coach Orr. And I was very fortunate as a kid to uh, kind of watch Hilton Magic uh, come into its own. And I was a ball boy. I was very fortunate. I had a friend who had a dad in the athletic department, uh, Bubba Lichtenberg. His dad, Tom, uh, was on the football staff and then was an uh, associate athletic director. So when they were looking for ball boys, absolutely jumped at the chance and had an uh, opportunity to be a ball boy for the football team at Jack Trice and then also for the basketball team. And just to watch Coach Orr, how he went up and down the sidelines, he was a larger than life figure, I think for a lot of us that grew up in that community. And to see the crowd just continue to grow and, and you know, the, uh, the excitement of when Iowa State played and to be a, uh, have a front row seat for that. This one, the ball boys, we used to actually sit underneath the basket, which was very dangerous. And, uh, but it was really cool to be a part of that and then just always dreamt of playing uh, in between those lines in that building. And when Coach Orr offered me that scholarship, uh, you know, I took a couple other visits, had, had some really great programs recruiting me. But at the end of the day, I knew where I needed to be, and that was in Hilton Coliseum. And to be part of that as a player uh, was an unbelievable experience. And then to have it as a coach, really I've been a part of Hilton Magic three times. And to see it as a kid uh, on the sidelines as a ball boy, and also we had season tickets up in the balcony uh, you know, before I was a ball boy and used to walk to the games and then have an opportunity to play uh, for Coach Orr and for Tim Floyd for my senior season and then to have the opportunity to coach in front of all the great people that gave me so much phenomenal support there as a player uh, was really special. So, you know, to be a part of that on multiple occasions is, uh, is pretty darn cool. How did you see it evolve over your three different experiences? Well, I, I think as, as a kid, I, you know, I kind of remember the first was when Barry Stevens uh, came in the game against Missouri where uh, he hit the game winner in the left corner, which was kind of his corner. He always seemed to hit that shot, uh, you know, behind the backboard, wherever he was on the floor, uh, just to see him. And then when Hornacek and Grayer uh, and Gary Tompkins and, and Victor and all those guys came in, uh, going back to LaFesta Roads, one of the greatest performances I have ever seen in Hilton Coliseum when he dropped 54 on Iowa. And, uh, you know, just to, just to see it uh, and experience, uh, you know, there's very few things that can shut down a town. But when it seemed like during those uh, glory years in Iowa State, uh, when Coach Orr was on the sidelines, the town really did shut down on game nights. And, you know, that's what it's all about. But, you know, it's just, it's amazing. You keep it close in that building. You're always, you always find a way to win it. And I experienced that as a player and certainly as a coach. We had some monumental wins uh, where it looked like we were down and out, but if we kept it close, we knew we would win in that building. Uh, just had a certain magical way about it, and the fans obviously were a huge part of it. Would you say that first Barry Stevens shot was the what you would consider the birth? I know that's where the term came from, but for you as someone who's experienced it, would you say that? Yeah, you know, it just, I, I don't know if I, I saw it as one moment. I know that was kind of the defining moment of the birth of Hilton Magic when Barry hit that game winner against Missouri. I just kind of saw it evolve and build from that time. And then, you know, you get a little lucky. I mean, Jeff Hornacek comes in as a walk-on and ends up, uh, you know, arguably the best player in the history of the school, at least from a professional career standpoint. And then, you know, getting Jeff Grayer, the caliber player, to get him out of the state of Michigan. Uh, you know, getting Victor out of Michigan, getting Justice Thigpen, who I played with, out of Michigan. And they really just kind of developed a pipeline with Coach Orr to, uh, to that state because of his history, obviously, coaching uh, at Michigan. So, uh, you know, just to see it evolve and then to play in a lot of those games, I saw it firsthand. Oklahoma State was probably the best game I ever played in when we were down by over 20 points in the second half and just saw Justice Thigpen bring us all the way back, uh, get us into overtime. And I was very fortunate. I made a free throw at the end of that game to give us a one point lead. The whole team ran at Justice coming off a stagger and uh, got fouled uh, making a layup and made the free throw. And then they called a horrible foul on Justice Thigpen. Ron Zetrick called it, I'll never, never forget it. And Darwin Alexander, who was the number one free throw shooter, in the Big Eight Conference at that time. I think it was an 87% free throw shooter. It was so loud in Hilton that the backboard was literally shaking. And he missed those free throws so bad. Uh, and again, that's Hilton magic, it's, it's the fans. Uh, but that was one of the craziest games I've ever been a part of. And to make that free throw and to see the number one free throw shooter uh, clank a couple up there was, was, was pretty awesome. I had the question set for later, but you already talked about missed free throws. 
What do you remember about the 2013 Iowa game when, when Mike Giselle missed two? Yeah, that, uh, that, that game was, uh, was incredible. George's little up and under uh, shot is, is one of the greatest, one, uh, greatest shots, certainly in my tenure at Iowa State. And uh, Mike Gazelle, who's a great shooter, great player, uh, gets up in the line. Same, same thing as Oklahoma State when I played. It, it was so loud in there. The floor had a little rattle going. The backboard was shaking a little bit. And a guy that steps up there that you just think is going to make the free throws and, and, and end the game uh, ends up missing. And we come down and took advantage of it. The same thing with Keaton Page from Oklahoma State, who I think was over a 90 percent free throw shooter he misses the one Naz hits the three at the buzzer and we win the game in overtime it just those types of things happen in that building and uh you know i can't explain why or what it is but it just has a way of uh of playing itself out what do you remember about that Naz shot yeah you know kind of gave Naz a great nickname with the threesis and you know he hit one not only there but he hit the same shot at oklahoma state to send that one over and i think we won that game a triple overtime uh, but that game at home, uh, you, you, again, we thought it was over. When Keaton Page steps up to the free throw line, he makes both those free throws as the game's done. And missed it. Uh, we throw the ball up the floor, and I think they expected him to make it as well because they weren't ready. And Naz throws into three, and then we end up beating a great Oklahoma State team in overtime. So I think there was four overtimes in the two times we played Oklahoma State that year, and Naz was a huge part of both of those wins. And then after that Oklahoma State game, went on the – the Big 12 tournament run and then on to the Sweet 16. Would you say that that shot itself was a turning point? And if so, how does, I guess, just Hilton Magic just build momentum? Well, that was, that was a special team. And we had so many great personalities on that team. And the way we won that Big 12 conference tournament that year, I think it was 17-1. to 1. We were down to Baylor in the championship game and we just kept chipping away chipping away deandre kane had such a great mental toughness to him uh, niang was as good as anybody in the conference melvin was a big 12 player of the year that year uh, you had naz you had matt thomas we just had so many great uh, personalities and players on that team and to see that group we were playing as well as anybody in the nation at that time and we always play the what if game in that north carolina central game where george broke his foot you know, I think there's a lot of what ifs because George was in such a, he scored 26 point, 27 points in 25 minutes, including about 10 on a broken foot in that game. And I'll never forget Craig Sager, who was doing the post-game interview, uh, right as he was about to do, the, when that was a very good North Carolina Central team. That, that, that had me very on edge going into that game. Very well coached, they slowed it down, they ran a million different plays, uh, but we really did a good job separating in the second half, and George was a huge part of that. And right before Sager uh, asked my first question, our trainer, Vic Miller, came up to me and said it's broken. And I almost couldn't do the interview. It was just devastating. And we go on after that, the team regrouped and we beat North Carolina without him on a great play by DeAndre going to the basket and then going into uh, the game at the Garden against Connecticut where Dustin Hogue, you know, another guy, glue guy in that team, goes for 36. And, you know, I just always think if we had George in that game, because George would have pulled their big guy away from the basket, that's what he was so good at. It's what made him who he was. And that guy had a bunch of block shots in the paint. So, you know, we ended up losing by five to the eventual national champ. So that's always the one I feel that got away, because I thought we had a great chance of at least being a Final Four team that year. The, the game that, in my mind, as a growing up a fan that I pinpoint is kind of the return of Hilton Magic was when Johnny Orr was in the building against Michigan. Yeah. How special was that day? To you? Yeah, that, that's, that's a game I'll never forget. And, you know, Coach Orr, his health had been declining a little bit. It was Dick Vitale's first time calling a game in Hilton. I think everybody that's an Iowa State fan remembers the interaction when uh, it was on Selection Sunday when uh, Vital and Coach Orr kind of went at it, and Johnny famously said, "When we kicked your ass," uh, when Dick was talking about the last time they played Johnny when he was at Michigan, and uh, you know to see him come back and walk out of the tunnel with him, and to see you know the one last time you know to see the band play "Here's Johnny" was just such a cool experience, and you know I just kind of stood in the sideline and soaked it all in, and we had one of our better games that year. I think Michigan was number seven in the nation and uh, Mitch McGeary was coming back that game, Nick Stauskas, they had a great team and we just played, you know, the, the entire game. It was just a perfect 
uh, 40 minute. The guys followed the game plan, and you know certainly one of the great games, and, and something that I will never forget for sharing the sidelines with Coach Orr uh, for the last time. And how, what was your relationship? Um, how did it grow with Coach Orr from when you were that ball boy? until his final time in Hilton. Yeah, I, just the stories that, that Coach would tell. And I played golf with, with, with Coach a, a, a bunch of times. In fact, one of his last times playing golf, uh, we played in a scramble with, uh, with Jim Hallahan, uh, who has since passed away, great leader and coach, um, you know, that really recruited me uh, to come to Iowa State, and Jack Parr and Johnny. So really four pretty average golfers at best. <laughs> And we won. We won this. Uh, we won the scramble golf event. And I dropped Coach off at the, his assisted living place after that, and just you know wa watched him walk in the building. But that was that was a memory again that that I'll never forget. Because when you play golf with Johnny, especially when you're in the same cart, just to hear the stories that he tells about all the different people that he played with growing up, and all the different uh, great players and Hall of Famers that he coached, that's what I think the relationship was with Coach Orr. My first year in the NBA with the Pacers, All-Star break came around, and a lot of times players will go, they'll go home or they'll go on these, you know, nice vacations, go to Vegas, uh, you know, maybe go to a, a Caribbean island. Uh, my wife and I went down and spent that first All-Star break with Coach Orr and with Rami, and you know that's the relationship that that he and I had, and he just was such a special person, and you know certainly the reason I'm where I am today. So George told me to ask you about the putter. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, that's the other thing about Coach Orr. His garage looks like a pro shop. And, you know, one thing about Coach Orr, he never turned down anything, especially if it was free. And he had probably 50 putters in his garage. And, you know, I just was out there and, you know, I was a poor college kid. And I, uh, I decided to to, yeah, I said, you won't miss this. So I just decided to take one and, you know, put it in my bag. <laughs> and he called me out on it. He knew that I had taken his putter. So, yeah, it was, again, that's, that's Coach. He, he, knows, uh, he knows everything. Uh, he would always tell you when he was done coaching, he was on assisted living, um, and you always bought when you were with him. He, he was very rarely opened up his wallet. <laughs> you talked about Coach's impact on you. What about his impact on Iowa State? Where do you think their program would be today if Orr never decided to leave Ann Arbor? Well, I, I always say this, that Coach Orr was, was certainly the most important figure in Iowa State basketball history, maybe in Iowa State sports history, for, for what he did for Iowa State, and really putting it on the map and coming off the success that he had at the University of Michigan, uh, runner-up finish to Indiana when they had their perfect season. And to get a guy that caliber to come into really a rebuilding type situation as Hilton was just being built and, uh, you know, just really throw it all in with a young group of guys uh, that I don't think he probably knew much about. And he, uh, you know, the, the, for what he did for Iowa State to put it on the map and grow and see the environment and the atmosphere that he created. And that's what attracted all the great recruits that certainly came for him and in the years with you know, all the different coaches that were there after him, Tim Floyd, Larry Eustachie. Uh, you know, I was very fortunate when I was there, what TJ is, uh, is doing now is all building on what Coach Orr uh, laid the foundation for with Hilton Magic and what he did for that program. The period where you would have been in an NBA front office, um, the McDermott era and maybe some of the Wayne Morgan era, it just kind of fell off. What was the energy level of the Iowa State basketball program, the fan support, before you took that job, and how much or how quick did it change? Well, I'll, I'll say this. I, you know, I think Coach McDermott, uh, he had there. There was a lot of talent there, and I think Greg McDermott is, is one of the top coaches in college basketball. There's no doubt about that for what he did at UNI and what he's doing now at Creighton. And sometimes you have teams that just don't fit together. And he got talent to come to Ames. And, uh, you know, again, for whatever reason, it didn't work out, I'm sure, the way that he planned or, or the way that anybody planned. But, you know, he goes on, and now he's one of the most successful coaches in college basketball with what he's doing at Creighton. I, I talked to Jamie Pollard and just said that my first order of business is to find a way to keep TJ on. And Jamie stepped up and, and offered uh, TJ a five-year contract that really matched my 
contract and uh, we continued to get uh, really good players in there. Uh, hiring Matt uh, was important in really helping get some of the transfers that we got in. In that first year, you know, my blueprint wasn't going in saying, all right, we need to take all these transfers and that's how we're going to build. It just happened to materialize that way. Uh, the first one was Jake Anderson that first year, and that was a fun team to coach. Deontay Garrett uh, was on that team, Jamie Vanderbeeken, uh, Melvin was a freshman, had a great year. Calvin Godfrey was a very promising young player on that team. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't work out, but that was a fun team to coach. And we ended up going 500. We were 16 and 16 that year. But what we saw was every day with the transfers, once we got Royce White, Chris Babb, Chris Allen, Anthony Booker, is we saw in practice what the fans didn't is a group that was building chemistry every day and a group that had the talent to really be something special. And in year two, when those guys became eligible, uh, you saw how quickly it flipped. And we were lucky that we were able to do that. With the transfer portal now, it would have been hard to build the team that way. Uh, but we you know, felt that was our quickest way to be competitive against Kansas, against Texas, against Oklahoma, against the great teams. And uh, we were fortunate that we got that talent to come in. And then once we established our style of play and getting up and down the floor and the amount of threes that we were shooting, they wanted to be a part of that. And that's how we got a guy like George Niang. When he saw Royce White initiating our offense as a front court player, that's how George, I think, fell in love with the system. And he could not have been a better fit for that. So, you know, I think once we got that uh, group of transfers, it really helped us flip it. And then you have some really good four-year players in there, starting with Melvin. Uh, and then you get Matt Thomas and Monte Morris and Naz Long, uh, you know, guys like that that really helped with the transfers and obviously George, uh, you know, to take it over the uh, take it over the hump. So, you know, just a, a great group of guys. I, you know, I give the players all the credit. I give my staff uh, a lot of credit for helping build that uh, uh, the foundation and really help bring the talent in to help us compete at the highest level. I remember that KU game, that Royce White year was. What do you remember about that game? I, I know, I think that was the first time, as me, I probably would have been 11. That was the first time I heard the term Hilton Magic. Yeah. Well, Kansas was always a special game. Kansas and Iowa were the two games that you always look forward to as a fan and as a player. You know, Larry Brown won in every arena in the Big Eight except for Hilton Coliseum, and that's how hard that building was to win in. So, um, I, well, I forgot the question. What was the question? <laughs> uh, we were talking about the 2012 KU game. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, Kansas and Iowa were the two games you always really looked forward to. And when we played Kansas, and uh, I don't remember if that was game day that first year, but, you know, we did end up getting a game day against Kansas. Uh, but I remember that game, Royce was unbelievable for what he was doing. And then Chris Babb, I remember that shot right in front of our bench. It really kind of put the game uh, out of reach. And, you know, never forget that shot. He hit it, just stood there, stuck his release crowd was going absolutely crazy and those are the kind of wins that really are program changers and when you can beat Kansas at home like that it, it just puts you on the national map and again it helps with everything it helps with recruiting obviously it helps with the excitement of your fans and it gives your team a lot of confidence to know that they can compete with anybody in the country. The next year was a loss to Kansas it was George his freshman year yep. when he took what everyone thought was a charge. Yeah. <laughs> what can you say about how angry and passionate Iowa State fans can get? Well, yeah, I mean, it's the, the thing that makes Iowa State special is, is the fans and how passionate they are about everything, any program at Iowa State, you know, whether it's women's basketball, what Bill Fenley has done with that program, with obviously with, uh, with the football program, with wrestling. I mean, it doesn't matter what sport it is, uh, the fans are going to have passion for it. And when we lost that game where George took a clear charge outside of the restricted area, not only that, but then there was a scrum on the ground and they come in from out of nowhere and call a foul on George on a loose ball uh, was just absolutely ridiculous. It was one of the worst calls that I have ever seen. And then they go out in overtime and beat it. In fact, we lost both Kansas games in overtime that year. Uh, one of the most devastating games of my career was at Allen Fieldhouse when Ben McLemore banked in the three in a shot that looked like it was going to sail over the backboard and lost that one. We hit 32 threes in two games and lost both of those games. But that call at Hilton was, was one of the worst I've ever seen. And you get the apology from the league, you get the apology from the official, but it did not help any of us feel any better. 
Uh, <laughs> I just, yeah, I, I remember even PTI talked about that. No. It's so crazy when PTI talks about Iowa State. As George's career went on, how did you see him embrace Hilton Magic maybe more than any other player? The, the thing that George, I give him all the credit in the world for is how he was embraced by the fans and how he created that brand for himself with everything that he did. And the biggest thing that he did, it was, it was smack talk to Iowa. And that I think is what really uh, allowed him to be embraced by the fans. And I'll never forget after the last time we played Iowa at home that time, and he said, don't forget it's a Cyclone State. <laughs> and you know, good for him, not good for me moving forward as a coach because of the bulletin board material. But that's what made George special. And he still, to this day, anytime Iowa, Iowa State play, he always goes back and talks about the when he blew the kiss at Carver, uh, when he made the reverse layup at home, uh, the game winner against Iowa, uh, and he just he has a way of rallying a fan base. And then the funny thing about it is, then the, the two fan bases will start an argument based on something that George posts on social media. But George is as important as anybody that has ever put on a Cyclone uniform. And he still goes back to Ames. He loves it. Uh, you know, I was very fortunate. Went back with him for Julie Flory's retirement this last year, and just be able to spend time with George. He's he's such a great kid, and he came and watched us in Orlando when the Sixers were playing down there, and just such an easy kid to root for because of, because of what he's all about. He's even smack talking Kevin Durant of all people. Which is he's, he doesn't care. He smack talks there. That's what I felt I, I, when I went out to see George Niang for the first time. A guy named Leo Papil, who is a longtime AAU coach. He worked for the Boston Celtics. I got to know Leo when I was working in the front office. And uh, Bobby Lutz on my staff had heard about George. And when I talked to Leo, he said, Freddie, I promise you, you come out and see George, you're gonna fall in love with him. And George played on a team with Nerlens Noel, who was a uh, top three draft pick. He played with Wayne Selden, a great player at Kansas. Uh, another player, Good Luck, who was a top 10 player that went to UNLV. He played on this great team. So I went out to see George at Tilton Prep School in New Hampshire. And I'm in the gym and it's Calipari, it's Bill Self, it was Roy Williams, it was me, and then there was a couple other uh, lower schools looking at some of their other players. And these guys were there to watch those other three guys. And I, go, I watched George Niang absolutely abuse Nerlens, hitting threes, up and unders, and the thing I like most is the smack talk after each of the shots that he hit, and running back and talking and pointing. He didn't care. Any of those guys were in the gym, and I fell in love with him and offered him on the spot. And that was we were fortunate because we were one of the first. I think we were the first high major team to offer. He visited us. He visited Iowa, committed on the spot, and then he blew up. He had an uh, MVP of the national tournament that year, uh, and he stayed true to his word and kept his commitment to Iowa State, which was certainly one of the most important things to ever happen for me as a college basketball coach. So your last game in Hilton, George would have been a junior. That was a very good team. Down 21 to Oklahoma. Oh. What do you remember about that comeback and how did it happen? Yeah, the comeback with the Oklahoma game and senior night's a tough one. I, 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 this game still bothers me to this day. I lost to Oklahoma on my senior night and I went three for 16. And to this day, it still kind of eats, eats away at me. And I always talk to our team about, you know, because it was very emotional for me to play my last game in Hilton Coliseum. And there's so many things that going on in your head. You know, it's your last time. I got to play well. You're tight. Uh, you just got to go out and enjoy the moment. And so it's always a dangerous game. And we dug ourselves a hole. We did not play well. The thing that flipped that game is uh, uh, Cousins for Oklahoma scored, talk smack to George, and they gave him a technical foul. Made two free throws. And I think we went on like a 28-4 to run after that and ended up beating a great team. Buddy Heald uh, was on that team, and uh, Spangler was on that team. They had a really good group of players and to go on that type of run against them. Once we got our crowd into it, once George got pissed off after the technical, uh, we were off and running and that's all it took. We just gave George the ball. We flipped it to him and he went into ISO mode against the switch and just made everything happen. So yeah, that was that was a lot of fun that game after honestly a pretty miserable 31st uh, first minutes of it. The play that always jumps out to me is the Hogue dunk. I think to put you guys down one. Yeah. Yeah, Dustin had a way, when he, when he got up, he, his head would hit the rim. And he had one of those against Kansas. He had one of the Big 12 tournament 
uh, against Kansas and that one against Oklahoma. Uh, it, it, not only did he dunk it, but then he kind of, you know, flew on the way down and it was, it just got the crowd uh, into it. And then, uh, you know, we hit, I think, four or five in a row after that as well. But yeah, Dustin, I think sometimes he was kind of the unsung hero of that team. And he just, he was our tough guy. And he was the one, he'd get the big rebound on both ends of the floor. And he'd make plays with, like that, with the dunk. And, you know, again, the 36 he scored at home in front of his family at Madison Square Garden uh, is a game I'll, I'll always remember. And at the time, you probably didn't know that that was your last game coaching at Hilton Coliseum. As, when did that sink in, I guess? At what point in your NBA career, maybe now? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I had a lot of great memories, uh, you know, certainly growing up in Ames and, uh, you know, had a great really lived out a dream playing in the NBA. It, it's what every player, uh, you know, it's what they it's what they want. The ultimate goal is to get to the highest level. And I was very fortunate. I got 10 great years. Uh, it was taken away from me with a heart condition. Uh, it was just really coming into my own as an NBA player. Uh, that was very difficult. Uh, to get the opportunity to go back to Hilton and coach after five years in a front office, which was a great experience for me, and, you know, get a chance to be a general manager. And, you know, the opportunity to coach at, uh, at Iowa State, you know, some of the greatest memories of my life, cutting down the nets at Sprint Center are two things that I will never forget. Share that moment with my twins who are up there in the ladder. One of them plays for me now, which is crazy. And, uh, you know, I guess making the decision to take the jump and get back to the highest level in one of the great franchises in the history of the NBA, the third largest market in the basketball world behind the Knicks and the, and the Lakers. And I played there and I knew the people in the front office. So when I made that decision and I turned down, I think nine NBA jobs before that, I needed, if I was gonna leave, it was gonna have to be really special. I found uh, of all the jobs that I've been offered, that was the one that made the most sense. Uh, looking back on it, uh, you know, it was great for my family. And I've got one of my sons, Jack, who played at Michigan State who's working for the San Antonio Spurs. I don't think that happens if I don't make that jump and get to know and network. Uh, you know, my daughter Paige is, has a great job with the Big Ten Network in Chicago now. Uh, one of my kids is playing for me. I don't know if that would have happened, uh, you know, without that experience. So, you know, it's ultimately, what does it do for your family? And when I look back at all the experiences, you know, one, I, I'm not a guy that lives with regrets. I've gone through too much in my life. I've had two open heart surgeries and I'm not a guy that will ever live with a regret. So, you know, what I'm really proud of is what we did at Iowa State to get it back to where it needed to be. And, you know, to see Steve Prohm have a couple really successful seasons uh, after we left. We, we left a very full cupboard uh, at Iowa State. And now to see TJ taking it to new heights is, is really cool. And I'm proud of TJ for, you know, for what he has done and how he has grown into being one of the most respected coaches in the country. So it's just, you know, what I see right now with Hilton Coliseum, I'm proud. And I still follow the team and I watch the team uh, all the time. And nobody cheers harder for him than I do as an, as an alumni and as somebody that has played a part of Hilton Magic on multiple different occasions. And, and that's, you know, those are the things that, uh, you know, that I will continue to do and, and, and hopefully follow for, for a long time. You're one of TJ's biggest mentors, closest friends, but in all of your dreams, do you see him turning it around that quick? Yeah, it's a remarkable story, what TJ did to take a team that had won two games the previous year and take it to a Sweet 16 in one season is an unbelievable accomplishment, an absolutely remarkable uh, feat uh, for what, what TJ did. And now to see it where it is today, uh, you know, one of the toughest, most resilient groups of guys that I've seen on a basketball court and see the recruiting class that TJ has coming in, uh, it's special. And, you know, watching those games at Hilton, seeing the fans, seeing the passion, uh, he's gonna continue to get great players to come in to Iowa State. So, yeah, it, it does. It warms my heart to see uh, the success that TJ's having and to see what that, uh, that group of guys is accomplishing on the floor. Taman Lipsy is a kid that used to go to my basketball camps. He played AU basketball with my twins growing up. Uh, you know, Rob and Holly, his parents, just to see Taman as a freshman, what he is doing, it's, uh, it's been pretty awesome.